everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be chairing this session this afternoon. Um, we will, I've already been announced, my name is Manuel Eisner and I'm um, from the Institute of Criminology at the University of Cambridge. Um, we have three speakers this afternoon who will be talking about the problems of measuring evidence-based pol prevention policies which is an important task to achieve change, to achieve um, change in crime rates, we need to know what is actually happening in terms of policy making and whether change in policy making has an effect on crime rates. Uh, we have three distinguished speakers here. Richard Wortley, who is the director of the Institute of Security and Crime Sciences at the University um, at, at University College uh, London, Alex Butchart, who is the director of the Unit for Violence Prevention at the World Health Organization, and Diego Fleiters, who is the director of the, now I have to check this, um, uh, the director of security policies, study and design at the Ministry of Security in Argentina. Um, Richard, um, please, you could you have? Your presentation. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, so I was asked to provide a general introduction to this session by providing an overview of uh, crime prevention. Now that's a fairly large task. We at our institution, we have master's degrees that are basically devoted to crime prevention. So to reduce this down to 20 minutes was quite a challenge for me. What I really want to do, I think, is cover two things. I want to talk about some ways that we've conceptualised crime prevention. Some, some of the popular models, some of the ways of dividing up the task. Um, oh, closer to my mouth. Thank you. Uh, some of the ways that we've uh, just divided up the task of crime prevention to various strands or kinds. I'll look at that. Uh, I want to look at two popular models and I want to propose a third that um, uh, my colleagues and I have used in some of our research. Then I want to address the issue of what works. And again, I'm no illusions here that I can provide anything in, in the way of giving you some answer about which kinds of crime prevention work and which ones don't. Rather, what I, what I want to do is, is examine the concept of what works. Uh, what do we mean by what works? How, uh, how do we uh, determine what works? Um, and in particular, I want to draw upon some research being done in my institute uh, to create for the UK a What Works Centre for Crime Prevention. And I'll walk you through some of the steps that uh, my colleagues have gone through in constructing that, uh, that centre and some of the challenges and issues that have ar arisen. So it's, that's, that's the aim of my session, really just to provide some scoping uh, information about uh, crime prevention and how we might address it. So let's start with some models of prevention. Um, people started to think about uh, categorising crime prevention really about 40 years ago and uh, in criminology we borrowed our models from, from the health system, from the public health system and in particular at the first attempts of trying to work out what we meant by prevention were taken from the preventative hair, uh, preventative hair care, I was going to say, preventative health care model. Um, and th the reason that this model really came into uh, existence in the health field was to get people to think about prevention beyond the usual knee-jerk way that they do, that is in terms of tertiary prevention. Um, I often ask my students, you know, what was the, the greatest uh, advance in the 20th century in terms of saving lives? And they'll talk about anti-cancer anti drugs, they'll talk about advances in surgery. But of course the answer is the, the greatest advance was uh, the purification of water and, and, in, and the introduction of indoor sewerage. So trying to get them to think about prevention in terms of stopping things happening before it happens. And this is intuitively hard for us. We reflexively seem to go back to think about prevention, whether it be in health and crime or crime, in terms of what we can do to a problem once we observe it. So the preventative healthcare model was built around that kind of mission to get people to think about preventing illness before it occurs. And uh, the familiar three steps in the preventative hair care, uh, I've said it again, the preventative healthcare model are primary, secondary and tertiary prevention. So primary prevention is measures applied before the emergence of a problem and it's applied population wide. I'll talk about some examples of that in a moment. 
Secondary prevention when it comes to healthcare is, are measures applied before the emergence of clinical symptoms in at-risk groups. And finally, tertiary prevention uh, measures applied after the emergence of a problem to affected individuals. And as I said, traditionally that's what we've thought of. When we think about healthcare, we traditionally think about going to the doctor, having our symptoms dealt with and our health uh, prevented in a sense that we don't get, get worse or we don't relapse. So if we think about that with health, these are some examples. Some primary health would be general health education, the sorts of messages we might see on TV to eat healthily and not to smoke and not to eat too much sugar. Uh, general wellbeing programs, nutritional advice, immunisation and so forth. Uh, and environmental sanitation, the example I mentioned earlier. We move on to secondary, then we're starting to talk more specifically about people who are at risk or already have contracted diseases where the symptoms aren't showing. So these could be targeted education programs. These could be dealing, for example, if you are in the area of HIV and AIDS, you might target your, your interventions to particular at-risk groups, such as uh, the, the gay community or uh, intravenous um, drug users. And then we move on to tertiary, and there, this is the thing we normally think of, I guess, uh, the idea of medication, surgery, retraining, community placement support. Um, the pattern, Patricia Brandingham, way back, uh, the date eludes me, I think in the early 70s, decided to try to translate that, that model into looking at crime. And they came up with primary, secondary and tertiary crime prevention. So some examples of primary prevention would be general environmental design, crime prevention through environmental design, for example, ways of designing uh, cityscapes, landscapes and so forth that reduce the uh, likelihood that crime's going to occur. General awareness campaigns again, crime prevention education and general deterrence. Again, things that are applied generally to the, to the broad population. They conceptualise secondary uh, prevention in terms of uh, working with at-risk groups, um, perhaps rather than just generally inv uh, introducing environmental design, going into at-risk communities, for example. So trying to find, so trying to target your uh, preventions. And again, tertiary, uh, again, the thing that we typically think of uh, the idea of re rehabilitation, punishment, the kinds of interventions that the criminal justice system ten tends to deliver. Uh, that worked for a while and then uh, people felt that that wasn't sufficiently directed at uh, the issue of crime and so um, uh, Tonry and Farrington came up in 1995 with a, an explicit criminological classification of uh, prevention. They came up with these four different kinds. Developmental prevention, this is intervention with individuals across the life course to, to try to stem the development of uh, criminality or criminal tendencies or um, uh, opportunities. Um, community prevention, they saw in terms of community initiatives, building um, urban renewal, those kinds of things. Situational prevention, these are, this is altering the immediate environments that is conducive to crime. So trying to work out where crime hotspots are looking at why they're hotspots. Why is it that this particular street, this particular house, this particular bank uh, is targeted and trying to redesign that, uh, the physical space there in a way that reduces the likelihood of crime. And finally, the traditional law enforcement uh, activities, uh, enacting and enforcing laws. And we can think of some examples here. So developmental, I guess the most obvious would be things like the Perry Preschool programs uh, in the US that um, uh, tried to deliver educational advantage to uh, disadvantaged children, parental training, those kinds of things. Community, as I've said, generally community development programs, urban renewal, neighbourhood watch, this sort of thing. Situational prevention, again, environmental design, target hardening, making it generally more difficult for people to commit crime. Things like CCTV and the like are situational interventions. And then law enforcement, the, the traditional specific deterrence, general deterrence and incapacitation and rehabilitation. Um, so they're the two existing models. I want to talk about a third way of looking at it. Um, I find that both of those aren't really target enough and um, my colleague and I, Stephen Smallbone, when doing work with uh, child sexual abusers, thought that it was an interesting way to proceed is to start thinking about targets for prevention. The, who's involved in a, for a crime to occur and what can we do to each of those components of a crime? 
Uh, this work borrows heavily upon the work of uh, Marcus Felsen and the routine activities uh, approach, and uh, I'll, I'll show that in a moment. So if we think about what, who, who the players are in a crime, we come down to three traditional players that Marcus Felsen identified, the offender, the victim and the place. And if we want to extend that, we can think about all of this occurring within a wider socio-economic or socio-cultural community. So one way to think about prevention is to target each one of those elements of a crime. We can reduce the offender's motivation or ability to offend. We can make it more difficult for a person or object to be victimised. We can make a potential crime setting less favourable favorable for crime. Or we can build community capacity against uh, the occurrence of crime. And uh, that's uh, an augmented version of uh, the familiar crime triangle, familiar to most of you perhaps, um, based on uh, Felsen's work. And as I said, I've added an encom encompassing community around that. I think we can even make this more useful if we go back to the original public health model and we can come up with this kind of prevention matrix. We can think about four targets for prevention, the four sorts of things that we might want to direct our interventions to, and we can think about each one of those again in terms of primary, secondary and tertiary prevention. I don't have time to go through that in great detail, I can see that now. Um, but for example, um, we can uh, think about um, trying to stem the criminal attitudes, criminal tendencies that offenders might develop uh, early on through primary prevention, uh, through developmental prevention, and then if they do offend, then that's when we can apply specific deterrence, rehabilitation, relapse prevention and the like. And again, we can think about victims in terms of building resilience in them prior to offending occurring, and then down to the other end where uh, tertiary prevention might focus on repeat victims. And you can go through each one of those. So I think it provides a very neat um, matrix of prevention targets and prevention strategies and it's one that we've used as I said before quite successfully in the child sexual abuse area and it's a model now that's quite commonly used in that field. So that's all I want to say really about ways that we can think about prevention. Um, prevention can mean many many things. I suppose the main message I'd like to get is for us to certainly take on board the importance of thinking about prevention uh, in terms of stopping crimes before they actually occur. Now certainly we can't do that all the time and there's a place for tertiary prevention, but as much as possible I think we need to think about ways that we can uh, implement primary and secondary prevention. I want to move on now in, uh, in the time I've got left to consider the issue of what works. So the whole uh, area of prevention has been energised I suppose in the last few years by uh, an emphasis by governments uh, around the world, really, towards evidence-based practice. So there's great enthusiasm for the idea of what works, for evidence-based policing, for evidence-based policy and so forth, not just in the crime area, but uh, in health, in education, in other areas of public policy. Governments want evidence that the things that they're spending their money on are going to deliver value for money. So this is particularly so when budgetary restraints uh, on departments mean that they have to use their money much more effectively. So this has occurred in the UK. There are a number of what works centres that have been developed that are designed to provide advice to practitioners on what kinds of activities have the best effect in terms of reducing whatever is the, the behaviour they're interested in. As I said, there's what works centres in education, there's what works centres in medicine. And a couple of years ago, the UK government put out a tender for, to create a What Works Centre in Crime Prevention. And UCL and um, uh, a consortium of other universities and, and players uh, won that grant, 3.3 million pound grant. And the task was to review existing systematic reviews, to create new 12 reviews, um, to create an internet What Works toolkit um, the focus that was decided upon was an intervention focus rather than a problem focus. By this I mean uh, the toolkit was designed to work out what kinds of strategies worked as opposed to what 
sorts of problems, uh, how problems were solved. So, for example, um, uh, the effects of early intervention in schools as opposed to what you would do to stop people becoming arsonists, if you see the distinction. Uh, these are our partners. Um, I'm obliged to leave that up for a few seconds so you can see them. Um, so uh, the first task was to look at existing reviews. So you'll all be aware that there are systematic reviews uh, increasingly done on a whole range of topics. Um, the team at UCL and their colleagues uh, initially allocated 16,000 crime reduction reviews. That was reduced, sadly, to 300 of sufficient quality. Uh, and when you account for overlaps, there were 60 intervention types that they were able to identify, and there's some of the numbers associated with that there. Um, in terms of existing reviews, uh, so reviews of reviews, if you like, uh, there were, I think, 40 uh, that they located. So you can see um, all of those. Uh, you'll, you'll find reviews for all of those topics uh, on, the, um, on the toolkit. Um, one of the innovative uh, aspects of the review was the creation of uh, th this acronym EMI. Um, what we uh, resisted very much from the start was to simply do construct these reviews and to come up with effect sizes. In other words, the simple question of does this strategy work or not seemed a nonsensical one to the research team. Uh, they thought that a much more nuanced uh, analysis of the research, uh, looking at a number of strands, provided a much more effective answer to that question. In fact, the question, as I'll go on to show, that the, the question, what works, is really a nonsensical question and can't be answered in a simple way. So certainly, um, the team needed to look at effects and effect size, how, how big, what the effect direction was and what size it was. They also were interested in the mechanisms, the underlying reasons for why that intervention ought to work. Why should CCTV, for example, reduce crime in certain areas? What's the theoretical underpinning for that? They also looked at moderators, a, a very important part. Under what circumstance does this intervention work? Under what circumstances doesn't it work? One of the lessons that was learned very early that not all interventions work everywhere. In fact, if there's a take home message, that's the message. Uh, implementation, how was it implemented and to what extent were those implementation characteristics, uh, how did that affect the outcome? And finally, uh, rarely covered but um, included in the review uh, exercise was what's the cost benefit analysis? What did it cost and can we have some evidence of uh, money for value, uh, value for money? Am I three minutes? I shall be very quick. This is the toolkit. I've got the URL up there. You can go back and immediately click on that and get into this toolkit. And you can see it goes through... Um, let's see. Where's the screen? Oh, it's up there. Okay. Um, you can go through and look at, uh, uh, at this evidence. I'll go, and, I'll go quickly through one, and that's... If you look at CCTV. So CCTV received two ticks under effects. So generally it was a found to be effective strategy. Uh, and then you can see the strength to which um, you know, the, the other factors come into operation. The important thing about the toolkit is you can click on it and get, get below it and get dis, um, explanations of the context in which CCTV works, CCTV works and see in which it doesn't. So I seem to be frozen here. Can you perhaps move me along? Oh, there we go. So this is just what I've said before. Does it work is not really a meaningful question. Things can work in some contexts and not others. We need to know what works for whom, in what circumstances and how. So let's look at the case of TV, a CCTV. What we found was, in fact, overall there's evidence that CCTV can reduce crime for property crime, but not for violent crime. And there are a number of reasons why it might work. Uh, the reviewers were debated the value of some of these. So perhaps there's a deterrent effect. To perhaps CCTV actually does increase the, uh, the chance of being arrested. Perhaps it increases informal surveillance by people who are nearby. Perhaps it sensitises potential victims. 
and they become aware that this might be an area they need to be careful in. Uh, some people have argued that the underlying mechanism might be that it instills community pride um, and that it assists the deployment of security personnel. The point is, trying to understand these mechanisms are important because it will help you decide when it works. I've got one minute to go, okay. Um, let me just talk about moderators and I'll show you just quickly through the screen. Um, what the researchers found, in fact, was that although CCTV, is, CCTV showed uh, to be generally effective, it was most effective in car parks, less effective in trying to stop violent crime, as I said, and more effective in the UK than it was in the US. So context was important, and these are the sorts of things that need to be considered. Um, so if you follow it through, if there's CCTV again, about three down, and if you click on that, you get to these descriptions beneath the toolkit, um, I don't have time to read them, but it basically describes those things that I've just said. It gives you a much more nuanced uh, understanding of CCTV, the effects of it, beyond just does it work or does it not work. And uh, I guess if the message I'd like to take home is if you're interested in uh, prevention, then I think that's the level of analysis you need to get to where you go beyond simply trying to answer a yes or no question. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Alex Petrog, please. Great. Um, thanks, Manuel, and thanks to the organizers, and good afternoon to you all. Um, I'll follow on from uh, what I consider a really great introduction by Richard to talking about what at WHO and with partners such as UNODC and UNDP, we have been doing by way of efforts to measure national violence prevention activities. And I'll explain why this is a really important thing from our perspective. I'll describe what's been done and what's to come. By way of introduction, though, I want you to put your minds into these leaders of the BRICS countries for a minute. At WHO, we're very used to this because we work with member states, and it's member states that really are, at the end of the day, our ultimate targets by way of policymakers and decision makers when it comes to violence prevention. That's what I'm talking about. I just want to clarify. I'm talking about violence prevention, not crime prevention. And we don't conceptualize violence in the same way as a criminal justice system would. Let me just put that clearly. So put, your, put yourself into the minds of these five individuals and imagine what they see when they look at the literature and they look at a conference like this or other conferences where people are talking about criminology or public health and violence prevention. They see something like this. They see a huge amount of talk about the size of the problem, about efforts to measure homicide, rape, assault, sexual assault, bullying, maltreatment, the uh, population attributable effects of being raped or being abused as a child, etc., etc. They see a huge problem and a tiny thing about prevention and response. So really the way our field appears to decision makers is very out of kilter, it's very imbalanced. And that might be kind of demoralizing. I mean, I'm not even sure if these, these leaders actually think about our problems really too often. But anyway, if they did, they probably wouldn't think that it's going to be a way of winning more votes to work on our area because they don't see prevention. They don't see much by way of a thing that's going to get them votes. So we need to change the situation. We need to in addition to continuing to improve our measurement of the problem, because indeed there are wide swathes of the world, large parts of different regions of the world, where we can't even count homicides yet. I'm not suggesting we stop trying to do that, but we should start trying to do far more measurement of prevention and response in order to get the balance right and give our politicians something to use or some, some reason to invest more in prevention. And then maybe we'll get to a point where we start to bounce the problem when we really start to show that we can make a difference as opposed to tracking trends over time and wondering why they seem to be reducing. So why do we want to do more to measure solutions? We want to increase the visib visibility of what can be done, and we've heard from Richard already what the evidence base suggests can be done. We want to identify policy and program gaps nationally, subnationally. 
We want to monitor efforts to increase prevention by type of violence, by type of strategy, and by country. And through doing this, we can strengthen evidence-based prevention and help to drive attainment, for instance, of the SDGs, not only the Sustainable Development Goal on Peace and Security, but also several others that are related. So, coming closer to what we're doing at WHO, a really good example that is cited by many public health people and other development specialists is the work that WHO has done over the last 20 years or so around tobacco control. And what they did in the early 2000s was to make a very conscious strategic decision to put a huge focus on measuring solutions, things that through multiple studies had been shown effective in reducing smoking, helping people to quit, reducing at a population level the number of new smokers, etc. They put together in a package and said, we will put huge emphasis on monitoring the extent to which countries are rolling out these interventions, monitoring, protecting people, helping people quit, putting warnings on cigarette packets, banning advertising, and raising taxes. And consequently, they had a huge impact and reached a billion, 2.3 billion people that are covered now by, or covered in 2012 by at least one Empower strategy. And this is, I think, a really good example of why it's as important to put as much emphasis on measuring the solutions as it is on getting them rolled out, because this then becomes a positive, a virtuous circle. People see that it's happening, and people see that they want to do more of it. Of course, we have probably stronger evidence in the value of these interventions in reducing smoking, which is a relatively simple problem to combat compared to violence, but nonetheless, we have decent enough evidence, I think, on violence prevention to move ahead in a similar way. So, what are some of the initiatives to measure solutions? One, which is partially similar to what Richard described, is the WHO Liverpool John Moores University Violence Prevention Evidence Base, and a closely related thing that we're working on called the Violence Prevention Information System. These basically trawl the evidence base, trawl the scientific literature to identify what works. And it's basically a rolling systematic review that is updated every six months, every year or so. I'll tell more about that just now. Then we've got two efforts that look at program uptake at national level and their impacts on risk factors, one of which is already done. And this is the WHO, UNODC, UNDP, Global Status Report on Violence Prevention. I'll describe some of the findings from that. Then a new initiative which is just starting called INSPIRE, and it has to do with ending violence against children. Both of those will put a big focus on measuring program uptake. And then, of course, the indicators for SDG targets that address the causes of or risk factors for violence is a really interesting area which hasn't been talked much about yet, but there are many of those other targets which address risk factors for violence, which if they could be measured in terms of their uh, efforts to um, achieve them, might tell us a lot about violence prevention in all policies. So to start with what's been done, I'll briefly talk about the Liverpool John Moores University evidence base and the status report on violence prevention. The evidence base on violence prevention is, as I said earlier, a rolling systematic review. It's uh, based on abstracts in the published literature. You can search this evidence base by type of violence, by year, and by WHO region or keywords. And it currently contains about, I think, 750 results. Um, and as yeah, it's searchable, and you get the abstract, and then you get a link to the study. You get some. Sorry, you get also a bit of information about the quality of the study, the nature of the study, whether it was randomized, controlled, trialed, uh, ecological, et cetera, et cetera. But rather than focus what's, on, what's in there, you can find this all by going online and saying violence prevention evidence base, it's all there. I'd, rather, I'd like to describe some of the trends that we've seen in terms of violence prevention studies. And here we can see how between 2006 and 2015, there was a general increase until about 2014 in the number of new studies published per year. This is across all types of violence that I described, scientifically published studies that look at an outcome such as self-reported assault, homicide, 
or an impact on risk factors closely associated with violence. So we see an increase until 2014 and then a rather alarming downtick in 2015, which seems to be due to a, a quite precipitous reduction in US studies of youth violence prevention, interestingly. Not really sure why. We don't know what's gonna happen in 2016. Where do these studies come from? Now, one of the things Richard didn't point out is the huge paucity of studies from low and middle income countries where the situation, where the community context, where the governance context may be very, very different. Indeed, the, the social control opportunities offered by the ordinary citizens may be very different to those in wealthier countries. And the evidence base is hugely skewed, first of all to North America and then to the wealthy North in general, um, as you see here. And that's something we really need to keep in mind because, as Richard correctly said, one of the challenges is, or one of the take-home messages is as an intervention is very difficult to generalize from one place to another. So it's very difficult to know how much of the evidence is indeed going to apply in Africa, for instance. But I think there are sound theoretical reasons to assume that many of these interventions with appropriate adaptation will work in most places. So going on to the status report on violence prevention, which describes the, uh, what countries are doing in their efforts to prevent violence. This is something we published in 2014 with UNODC and UNDP. It aimed to describe the state of the problem of violence, document what countries are doing, and identify gaps and actions that could be taken to address these um, gaps. What we looked at in the status report on violence prevention were the existence of national plans, capacity for collecting data on homicides and non-fatal violence, for instance, through surveys, prevention by way of policies, programs and laws, and the availability of health, social services, and legal services. And we focused on the five types of violence listed there, child maltreatment, youth violence, intimate partner violence, sexual violence, and elder maltreatment. And contrary to what Manuel was suggesting in a small meeting yesterday, the information in this report was not completed by an individual in each country. It was done by an expert group rec uh, recruited from multiple ministries. I don't think it changed the fact that many countries wanted to put on a better show or show themselves to be better than they were. But anyway, it wasn't just an individual. Um, some of the findings, bearing in mind that countries did tend to bias themselves, put themselves in a better light. National action plans are not always informed by data. Now, in public health, it's an axiomatic basic truth that all action plans should be based on data. So it's quite alarming, for instance, to see how few youth violence prevention plans are informed by data, and so forth. Prevention programs. We um, examined this, these 18 so-called best buy prevention programs based on the evidence. And don't worry about the detail. Um, the important finding is that only one out of three countries reported implementing these programs at larger scale. And larger scale does not mean large scale. It meant in communities across a whole, uh, in schools within a whole municipality or a whole province, by far from nationally. These are rough measures. These are, it's very difficult to, to know how best to measure this, especially in federal set settings. But that's one out of three countries which is doing something at larger scale, meaning that two thirds of countries are not really doing anything by way of prevention programming to stop it from happening in the first place. Cross-cutting prevention policies, we looked at the trying to keep kids in school, primary school, secondary school. We looked at upgrading the built environment, slum upgrading. We looked at measures to control access to alcohol and firearms. Most countries have got very similar looking alcohol and firearm laws, but there are huge differences in the extent to which they are implemented. Very few countries are doing systematic efforts to keep kids in school, to help them get educated, well enough so that they are less likely to become victims or perpetrators, and even fewer countries are doing crime prevention through large-scale environmental or urban upgrading. By way of prevention laws, we looked at 12 prevention laws covering the different types of violence I listed, and we asked to, which, to the extent to which they existed versus the extent to which they were fully enforced. I can't recall what fully enforced 
really meant, but it sounds good. And we found that 80% of countries had enacted these laws, but just over half said they'd fully enforced them. So there, once again, you've got a huge potential for more enforcement. Victim services, we asked about six victim services across the countries that responded, ranging from adult protective services for people at risk of or being abused, older people, through to child protection services. Child protection services were reportedly the most uh, prevalent and adult protective services for people, older people being abused the least. What was really important though was under half of countries said that they had mental health services specifically designed to accommodate the needs of victims of violence. Not restricted to victims of violence, but able to accommodate them. And alarmingly, just 15% of countries in the African region had such services. Uh, alarmingly, because the consequences of violence are, uh, include further perpetration of violence and things like alcohol abuse, substance abuse, drug abuse, etc., in addition to serious mental health outcomes. So the lack of mental health services is worrying. So that, that's a little snapshot of the Global Status Report on Violence Prevention. Very briefly, what's to come? I mentioned the Violence Prevention Information System, and this looks at intervention effectiveness. This is going to be the big brother of the Liverpool John Moores University um, vi uh, Violence Prevention Evidence Base. This will be an online one-stop shop which looks at prevalence, risk factors and causes, and prevention programs brand effectiveness across the main types of interpersonal violence as well as for poly victimization and homicide. On the prevention side, we'll be looking at prevention policies and programs, typically using the information that comes from the scientific literature, and then examples of evidence-based programs that have been scaled up. We anticipate that this should come online in early 2017. So the next what's to come example is this INSPIRE, seven strategies for ending violence against children. Goal 16.2 calls for ending violence against children and WHO initiated this effort along with nine other agencies, several of which are UN agencies as well as some US government partners. And the aim is to bring together the best available evidence on preventing violence against children our goal is to launch this in mid-July this year. The seven strategies for ending violence against children are all evidence-based insofar as we restricted them to those where we have randomized controlled trials, uh, with the exception of what we called prudent practices, which are those called for by the Convention on the Rights of the Child with regard to certain laws. So the strategies are income and economic strengthening, and an example there would be conditional cash transfers coupled with parent training. Norms and values, and there we looked at community mobilization programs aimed at uh, encouraging awareness of gender norms and so forth. Safe environments, typically um, uh, prevention through environmental design. We've got an example of John Shepard's Cardiff example, working in schools, whole of school approaches to reduce bullying and so forth. Parental and caregiver support parent training in groups or individually through home, base, home visiting, implementing and enforcing laws with a focus on laws around alcohol, laws around firearms and child sexual abuse laws, response services, the focus really there is first and foremost on trauma-informed uh, trauma cognitive behavior therapy, but for settings where there are more resources, we also talk about uh, offender rehabilitation programs and uh, enhanced foster care programming. And then education and life skills includes both keeping kids in school and providing life skills training to kids in school so that they can be more resilient in the face of drug abuse, alcohol abuse, violence, and so forth. Our vision is that governments will routinely implement and monitor these interventions to prevent and respond to violence against children and help them reach their full potential. Importantly, what we will try and do with INSPIRE is to do what was done with Empower and put a big emphasis on measurement, on measuring the extent to which governments take up the strategies, roll them out, and the population reach of these strategies. 
And we've looked at several widely used international questionnaires, such as the Global uh, Schools-Based Health Survey, the multiple, multiple indicator cluster surveys that UNICEF does, the demographic and health surveys, and so forth. And we can put together questions from those existing surveys that cover many of the interventions. In other words, we can ask kids through the Global Schools-Based Health Survey, we can find out what proportion of children didn't go to school because they were scared of being exposed to violence, etc. We can find out what proportion of new mothers were exposed to some kind of advice and support about how to be a better mother, etc. So very last thing, very quickly, and this is the most abstract and the most theoretical part of the talk. All of these SDGs have within them targets that bear upon some of the structural determinants or the societal level determinants of violence. And if governments are really going to be eradicating poverty and improving health and so forth, then if we are able to measure these, we should be able to correlate measures on these targets with measures of prevalence for the different forms of violence that are targeted in 16.2 and uh, goal five, et cetera. And we should theoretically be able to see how efforts to advance these targets correlate with reductions in violence or otherwise. It's a big if. So what are some of the challenges? My last slide, laws. I think the presence and the quality of laws can be objectively established if you have enough money. The enforcement and the effects are difficult to assess. Policies, standalone policies in any language can be assessed if you've got the money, but it's really hard to evaluate the effects of multiple interacting policies. Prevention programs, I think it's quite reasonable to say that we can measure the presence and the reach of these through population-based surveys, but it's really difficult to assess the quality of programs and implementation fidelity. The same goes for services. And with that, I will say thank you and hand back to Manuel. Thanks. Buenas tardes. Quería agradecer a UNODC y a Linegui la posibilidad de hablar en esta conferencia. Y antes de avanzar, también quería aclarar que, si bien soy director en el Ministerio de Seguridad, eh, voy a hablar a título personal, ¿no? obviamente en la presentación de, del Ministerio. En, a lo largo de mi charla voy a tratar de discutir distintas cuestiones vinculadas a, a las políticas de seguridad y al uso de evidencia, un poco tratando de, de analizar la política alrededor del tema, ver algunas cuestiones metodológicas y finalmente ver algunas eh, experiencias respecto a análisis de, o evaluación de políticas de seguridad en Argentina. Eh, bueno, para empezar, creo que me parece importante eh, recordar que esta discusión de uso de la evidencia en realidad se está en el marco de un largo proceso de avance, de búsqueda de eficacia, de proceso de racionalización, en el que eh, el conocimiento ha sido una de las claves para la mayor eficacia en distintos ámbitos, en búsqueda de mayor ganancia de las empresas, mayor efectividad de los ejércitos o de las instituciones. Y, curiosamente, es un proceso que quizás llega tardíamente a, a materia de seguridad ciudadana o seguridad pública, y es algo para, sobre el cual hay que preguntarse por qué esta demora en llegar. Eh, dentro de este proceso, eh, también quería resaltar que hay otros conocimientos que no son exactamente científicos, como eh, conocimientos prácticos y tecnológicos, conocimientos organizacionales, conocimientos, llamemos luego, morales, que son importantes y son importantes también para el cambio organizacional y creo que hay que tenerlo en cuenta si queremos eh, llevar a organizaciones hacia una mayor eficacia, un mayor conocimiento y no solo quedarnos con el científico que es muy importante. Y por otro lado, la ciencia, como sabemos, ha revolucionado muchas áreas, eh, en particular en el, en el último siglo, ha dado una velocidad de cambio muy grande y está empezando a ser prometedor respecto al campo de la seguridad. Sin embargo, hemos visto bueno, a lo largo de varias discusiones que hay fricciones y rigideces para la utilización de la ciencia en el desarrollo de políticas, 
también la ciencia tiene sus propias limitaciones metodológicas para eh, la comprensión de un problema tan complejo como es el de la seguridad. Y además hay, hay muchas disputas metodológicas alrededor de qué método científico se debe utilizar. Eh, en este escenario, además de... Eh, digamos, del, del uso de la evidencia en las políticas, nos encontramos que hay muchos actores eh, que tienen distintos intereses, limitaciones y tipos de conocimiento, que bueno, esto genera tensiones y entran en conflicto y eventualmente en luchas de poder. E incluso, sin enumerar todos, a veces, en el caso, pensando sobre todo en la región, esta, esta idea de, de, en, de la ciencia o los científicos llevándole la verdad a los políticos para que ellos tomen las decisiones en base a la evidencia, más a acordar un, un viejo chiste de Jacques Lacan, que de, de, de la definición del amor, que decía que era dar lo que uno no tiene a alguien que no, quiere, no lo quiere. Digamos, no, no es sorprendente que después en Latinoamérica tengamos poca generación, al menos hasta recientemente, tanto de políticas como, como de evidencia. Eh, algunos problemas quizás concretos que se pueden mencionar para enumerarlos rápido son, eh, por un lado veo que hay problemas de, eh, de comunicación entre el mundo político y el científico, hay malentendidos alrededor de, de, eh, del lenguaje científico, cosa que a veces además es utilizada por, por los científicos. Además los políticos no siempre tienen capacidad o elasticidad para definir políticas en base a la evidencia. También relacionado con eso, vemos que eh, no toda decisión se basa en cuestiones científicas, sino también hay cuestiones distributivas, de construcción de consenso, o incluso de principios que exceden a, a, la, a las simples cuestiones de evidencia. Eh, además, a veces centramos a ver evidencias o estudios muy sofisticados a la hora de implementar políticas pueden tener una utilidad marginal decreciente, quizás a veces necesitamos políticas muy contundentes, ¿no? un, un nivel de sofisticación como a veces se plantea. Y además realmente a veces hay conflictos de poder entre los políticos y los tecnócratas y el mundo científico que uno quiere ocupar el espacio del otro y viceversa. Eh, Siendo una discusión que incluso algo mencionó Manuel en una charla que hubo ayer, eh, y pensando en estrategias de, de cómo tratar de anclar el uso de evidencia en las tomas de decisiones, eh, hay experiencias en, en otros ámbitos de bueno, tratar de obligar institucionalmente a cierto uso de la evidencia. Eh, se puede mencionar como antecedentes, bueno, es común que, que, que haya normas que exijan en los procesos administrativos explicitar las causas y objetivos de las decisiones, eh, en otros eh, eh, marcos, en particular en, en, en la cooperación internacional se exigen utilizar marcos lógicos, y quizás un, un pionero en todos estos temas también fue la evaluación ex ante de impacto ambiental, en que se exige para hacer ciertas obras, que bueno, uno tiene que fundamentar y medir el, el ex ante el impacto que van a tener, y en forma más reciente las evaluaciones de impacto normativo o regulatorio. Bueno, de, si bien uno a veces puede pensar que estos son ideales, obviamente no hay políticas ideales, creo que deberían ser formuladas de manera gradualista, con las limitaciones que tienen ambos actores, no hay que pasarse de sofisticados, y a su vez también eh, promover el cambio en las culturas eh, políticas y de las organizaciones. <ríe> Volviendo un poco a la ciencia, bueno, hemos dicho que hay un gran debate alrededor de, bueno, Qué, cuál es el método científico adecuado, cómo se debe generar la evidencia en seguridad. Y en general, no solo en este ámbito, sino en la ciencia general, hay, bueno, se, es, hay muchas discusiones y también trampas de cómo se debe hacer la ciencia. No sé si pueden poner en, en on el... El video. Shows how sugar might fuel the growth of cancer. A new study shows late night snacking could damage the part of your brain that creates and stores memories. A new study finds pizza is the most addictive food in America. A new study suggests hugging your dog is bad for your dog. A new study showing that drinking a glass of red wine is just as good as spending an hour at the gym. What? Y bueno. <laughs> Eh, hay, hay dos malas noticias, una yo creí que la teoría esta del vino tinto y era falsa, y la otra es que también, si bien esto es casi paródico, 
hay veces nos encontramos casos así dentro del ámbito de la ciencia aplicada a las políticas de seguridad. Entonces, bueno, creo que ahí sí hay una cuestión de, de mejorar sobre esas y algunos de los puntos los, los voy a discutir a continuación. Dentro de, y dentro del debate sobre qué es la ciencia y cuál es el método, me parece muy importante recordar que hay muchas herramientas metodológicas y que tenemos que tratar de apostar para su uso integral y riguroso, eh, ¿no? eh, desde las cualitativas, estudios de casos, análisis institucional, metodologías cuantitativas, en, dentro de esas los experimentos aleatorios que, y otras, que bueno, deben ser usadas integralmente y tratar todas con más rigurosidad. Y sí, no, no hay que eh, elegir una herramienta porque queremos herrami esa herramienta, sino que hay que buscar eh, cuál es la más pertinente, la más adecuada para la pregunta que queremos resolver y, y obviamente esta, esta respuesta tiene que ser lo más simple posible. Esto que parece obviedades no lo es eh, si uno se dedica a, a, a ver estudios sobre, sobre seguridad. Eh, enfocándonos en particular con las metodologías cuantitativas, sin duda son, son claves para la producción de evidencia, tienen un poder, pueden tener un poder explicativo muy fuerte, pero tienen sus propias limitaciones, eh, eh, prácticamente diríamos inherentes, una son que pueden hacernos dejar de lado problemas o políticas claves que no pueden ser medidas mediante esta herramienta, pero pueden ser muy importantes. Otros son los problemas que ya se mencionaron de calidez, eh, calidad perdón, y validez de los datos en temas de seguridad, que es un problema muy serio. Yo ahora estoy, respons estoy responsable del tema, ya antes lo trabajaba. Realmente eh, hay problemas muy serios, en, al menos en Latinoamérica, eh, eh, sobre, la, sobre los datos y creo que hay que los estudios científicos que no dan cuenta de, est de estos problemas o que asumen que, que son buenos, deberían ser considerados no científicos y también es algo que es muy común que ocurra. Eh, por otro lado, tampoco dentro de las limitaciones es que si bien nos, eh, dentro de los modelos eh, experimentales se quieren acercar a los a cierto gol estándar de las ciencias médicas, eh, no llegamos eh, a es imposible que podamos cumplir todos esos requisitos, por ejemplo, el doble ciego o a realizar análisis clínicos. No podemos, hacer, podemos hacer el experimento, pero no podemos hacer una autopsia del, del cadáver. Eh, el, hay otro problema que ya se mencionó de los problemas de validez externa que tienen de todos nuestros trabajos. Y, y además que también algo que bueno, se mencionó el día de ayer, que en problemas complejos, con poblaciones heterogéneas y a su vez con eh, muchas intervenciones con muchas dimensiones, es muy difícil medir el impacto y en especial si es con datos agregados. Bien, más allá de estos problemas inherentes, creo también a, a veces se cometen errores en, en, en el uso de estas herramientas, eh, por ejemplo, confusión entre la significancia y la fuerza de la relación, eh, son obviedades, pero que se, es, uno las ve en forma cotidiana cuando analiza los papers en la región. Eh, la conclusión que, de, que una relación impacto no existe porque no la pueden ver en el experimento, eh, eso que es un error metodológico muy, gra muy grande. En general los experimentos están eh, diseñados para demostrar si funciona una política, no de para demostrar que no funciona. Entonces no se puede concluir directamente que no funciona. También es un error muy común. Otros errores comunes son de enfocarse excesivamente en los betas de la regresión sin tener en cuenta el poder predictivo del conjunto o el peso relativo de otros betas. Los betas, para los que no lo saben, es el coeficiente que, digamos, que explica el peso de una parte de una, de, eh, de una regresión, de una categoría de una variable en una regresión. Eh, hay abuso de los supuestos. Eh, muchas veces no se verifica, como dije, la calidad, consistencia y validez de los datos. Muchas veces, porque son oficiales, se dan como buenos, cosa que considero que es incorrecto. Y, y además falta explicación de las cadenas de causalidad y los marcos teóricos que, que, las, que las explican. En ese sentido me parece muy bueno lo que comentaba Richard de estos EMI que tratan de, bueno, de dar cuenta de todo cómo es el proceso de... de de, de, de causa y efecto y, y otras condiciones que, 
que generan eh, el impacto de la política. Yo he visto en la región eh, evaluaciones de impacto que de, de una política simplemente contra la aprobación de la ley. Evidentemente ahí había una, una debilidad de, en la relación causal muy grande. Ya siendo la Argentina, eh, hay, hay pocos estudios en nuestro país sobre, eh, sobre eh, evidence-based policies, y en realidad es más, son más que sobre policies, evidence-based policies, son eh, evidencias sobre eh, políticas hechas previamente. Eh, quizás eso muestra como es un, un sesgo en realidad en el trabajo que estamos haciendo. Eh, hay algunos más, no hay muchos más trabajos sobre, eh, sobre estos temas. Tengo algunas objeciones sobre algunos de estos trabajos que las, las dejé ahí para otro momento y, y algunos de los cuales los voy a com comentar más adelante. Y ya haciendo en concreto a, a algunos casos de de evidence-based evidence -based policies, quizás algunos casos cerrados, y este me parece interesante, pues estamos viendo un actor que es distinto al que quizás estamos pensando, es ver cómo la, el poder judicial, cómo la justicia usa la evidencia, y a veces eh, en casos, eh, lo hace en casos concretos, usa cierto conocimiento científico para decir un caso, y a veces define directamente política, sobre todo cuando tienen un rol proactivo, de judicial proactivo, y en Argentina, en el año 2009, la Corte Suprema decidió que la penalización del consumo de drogas era inconstitucional y uno de los argumentos que usó fue que las políticas de drogas eran ineficaces. Eh, digamos, fue uno de los dos principales argumentos que usó. Pero, ¿qué, pasó? ¿Qué problema había? Este argumento lo sostenía simplemente mediante una cita, un resumen ejecutivo de un informe de drogas de UNODC, que además habían eh, descontextualizado, lo habían malinterpretado. Acá quizás vemos un problema de cómo usar mal las, las supuestas evidencias. Se haciendo a, a trabajos en, en los que eh, he participado o, o estamos llevando a cabo, a, quería mostrar acá eh, un trabajo sobre el impacto del plan de recolección de armas, que en el que participé tanto en su diseño como después en, también en su evaluación. Fue un plan que permitió recolectar 150.000 armas eh, eh, en Argentina del 2009 al 2013. Y podemos ver que eh, eh, este plan permitió y generó una caída del 25% en los suicidios con con armas de fuego, y hicimos, y como hubo tasas eh, de recolección diferentes por provincias, hicimos un experimento, una suerte de experimento natural, y vemos que en, la, en, la, en el tercil, que fue más alto el nivel de recolección, fue mayor la caída de, de los suicidios con armas de fuego, y también fue, mayor, eh, fue menor el incremento de los suicidios totales, lo que, cual haría pensar que tuvo un efecto moderador del dentro del incremento general de suicidios. Mientras en, en los otros grupos, eh, la caída de los suicidios con armas de fuego fue menor y la, in, el incremento de los suicidios totales fue mayor. Eh, otro, otro caso de evaluación de políticas, o en este caso quizás más de regulaciones, respecto al uso de armas de fuego por las policías fuera de servicio, este fue un trabajo hecho a partir de medios de comunicación, después contrastados con datos oficiales. Acá vemos, hay dos grupos, uno en el que de policías, uno en el que está permitido o es obligatorio el uso de armas, y el otro en el que está prohibido el uso de armas o restringida. En el grupo que, está, eh, que es obligatorio, el, hay un, una, una cantidad muy grande, un cantidad y porcentaje muy grande de, eh, de, de homicidios de policías fuera de servicio, mientras que en las policías que está prohibido o restringido no hay, ni, no hay casos de, eh, de muertes de policías fuera de servicio. Eh, otro, otro dato, este sí lo he, lo he hecho trabajando con, con mi equipo en la, en la dirección del Ministerio de Seguridad, esta es una evaluación de impacto de, del plan Cinturón Sur, que era un plan de saturación policial, que se hizo en julio del 2011, en el que se desplegaron 2.500 efectivos de gendarmería y prefectura en una zona de la ciudad. 
Y eh, lo que muestra el gráfico es que eh, este gráfico nos señala, nos muestra eh, en la línea azul las, eh, el área intervenida, que es la del cinturón sur, la naranja, la, el área de control, esto siguiendo eh, un paper hecho por, en parte un paper hecho por Fernando Caferata, que antes eh, eh, no mencionaba, y nos muestra que sí, a partir de la línea de intervención se ve una caída, y, pero después eh, empieza a perder efecto esta intervención y eh, empieza a subir un poco. Lo cual además lo, se puede ver también en unas encuestas y en datos de homicidio que están acá. Sí, ya eh, quedando pocos slides. Eh, esto es un dato que recién lo estamos terminando, de, está tibio, está recién sacado del horno. Eh, Quizás lo interesante más allá del dato es, eh, creo que es la, eh, el, el tipo de información que estamos usando y creo que señala una ventana de oportunidad para mejorar la, las dificultades que tenemos en la medición, que es el uso de tecnologías, de nuevas tecnologías. Y acá estamos midiendo eh, el impacto de los niveles de patrullaje contra dos fuentes de información distintas. Perdón, estos niveles de patrullaje los estamos midiendo con con GPS en cada comisaría y vemos, bueno, qué, qué nivel de patrullaje se, se logró en forma georreferenciada. Y, lo que, y esto lo estamos viendo, por un lado, contra los datos de 911, de, o sea, las líneas de llamadas de emergencia, que la, incluso la podemos ver hora por hora cuántas llamadas hubo, bueno, o cada llamada, una cantidad muy grande de datos, y después, eh, arriba a, a la derecha, y vemos las denuncias en las comisarías. Lamentablemente, eh, en principio esto nos está mostrando que el nivel, acá el coeficiente que usamos bastante básico es el, un R de Pearson, ni siquiera es un R cuadrado, eh, lo que nos muestra que es bastante bajo y quizás habría una primera hipótesis que sobre que el, si el patrullaje esquemático no tiene impacto en los niveles de delito, cosa que bueno, acá nos muestra que el, el nivel es muy bajo. Lo que estamos viendo ahí además son las comisarías, de las 54 comisarías, las que tuvieron nivel más alto de, de R de Pearson, el resto directamente son eh, muy bajos. Entonces esto nos, en principio nos mostraría que eh, este patrullaje no tiene impacto en los niveles de delito, pero bueno, tampoco hay que descartar primero otras dos cuestiones que, que son si no estamos teniendo problemas en, en el modelo de análisis que estamos haciendo, que por ahora es bastante básico, y además si no hay problemas en los datos. Entonces, y ya para terminar, bueno, ya me quedo. Eh, creo que realmente, más allá de las críticas que, que, que he realizado a, a la ciencia, creo que el conocimiento en general y la ciencia en particular son claves para la mejora de políticas, y, y creo que sin, ol, sin olvidar este saber o expertise quizás técnico o operacional que pueden tener las fuerzas, que no es exactamente ciencia. Eh, y me parece también que tenemos que tratar de desarrollar estrategias gradualistas para su mas, el mayor uso de evidencia en el desarrollo de políticas y en la toma de decisiones, teniendo en cuenta las restricciones eh, políticas institucionales que existen y de capacidades. Y además que, bueno, que es importante tener, usar todo tipo de, de metodologías científicas en, de manera integral. Y finalmente eh, eh, tenemos que tener en cuenta las limitaciones y, pertene y pertinencias que tienen cada metodología y tratar de fortalecerlas. Y ya como último comentario, eh, sí me parece que el, las nuevas tecnologías... Eh, pueden, eh, digamos, una ventana de oportunidad muy, muy grande para romper la simetría de información, la capacidad de medición y, cons y consolidar la calidad de los datos que, bueno, que antes era muy difícil. Gracias. So, thank you very much for these three excellent contributions to the question of how to measure and implement um, prevention policies. Uh, so far I've received two questions. Um, I don't know whom they are directed to, so I will just um, throw them at you and then whoever feels competent to answer. 
um, can answer them. The first one is about violence prevention efforts, namely why is male adult violence omitted from the global catalog of violence prevention efforts? I don't know, maybe that's for you, Alex. Um, male violence is not omitted from a global catalog of evidence-based programming. It's right there. And in the violence prevention information system, homicide is clearly there. One of the challenges we have in the global policy arena is the very, very strong focus upon women and girls, which is very, very strong for good reasons because of the gender inequities that have characterized the past. It does, however, make it extremely difficult within the international violence prevention policy arena to get a word in for adolescent and young adult males. Um, there have been several editorials in The Lancet bemoaning the fact and observing that the marginalization of males within health in general is a serious problem and something that needs to be corrected. And it's not the least in relation to violence prevention. So I really thank the person who asked that question and maybe others would like to comment on it too. Because it might be very different from a criminological point of view. I'm talking about it from a public health perspective. We had a second question which, which I find quite interesting because I think all three of you adopted a science-driven approach. And this question asks whether considering weapons of mass destruction, espionage devices, cybercrime, etc., could we really say that technology and science are improving people's lives or are they the threat to our existence? Now, I'm not sure exactly what the person who asked the question meant, but I, I, I assume it's about, well, is this science-focused approach that we are taking here really part of the solution or part of the problem? Um, well, I, um, I think science uh, and technological developments are a double-edged sword. And what we see in crime is that technological developments are both driving crime but are also being used to respond to crime. Uh, I think we're forced into taking scientific uh, approaches and technological approaches to reducing crime because offenders are taking scientific and technological approaches to committing them. And uh, we're essentially uh, in a scientific uh, um, uh, war uh, situation where um, uh, we need to re respond to the, uh, the, the novel ways that uh, offenders are committing crime. We need to come up with novel ways of preventing that that's going to induce them to come up with novel ways to overcome that. And so we're in, a, we're in a bit of an arms race. So I don't think we can just sit back and say, well, uh, let's eschew a scientific approach because uh, science is evil. Uh, if we eschew it, uh, uh, um, the um, offenders aren't necessarily going to. The people who are you know, using these technologies for, for ill good. Sí, de acuerdo con, con lo que decía Richard, el, la ciencia puede ser una espada de dos filos y, pero bueno, está, al mismo tiempo estamos condenados a usarlas, no tenemos otra opción de, que tratar de, más allá de que hay problemas y además hay bad science, tratar de utilizar la, la ciencia para la mejora de, la, de políticas. Bueno, igual hay, hay otros, eh, yo puede chocar con otras cuestiones, con cuestiones políticas que pueden ser igual de importantes o morales y la cuestión es cómo hacer el, un, un trade-off uh, adecuado entre todos, todas ellas. Richard, can I, I, I would like to follow up on your meta-analysis meta of meta-analysis okay. review. Uh, because you should, yeah. right. Um, I think it's probably important um, because you showed it to the audience with the web link mm -hmm. to get an assessment from you about the extent to which you think that colleagues here in Mexico or in Argentina should use the evidence that you've put together as evidence that should, could guide their decisions. Because Alex made the point that we have very little research in context other than Europe and the United States. 
And we are always speculating about the extent to which we can transfer information. And I just wonder, maybe Alice can comment on this as well, to what extent can we trust? The whole, the whole logic of the, of the um, dashboard that's been developed at UCL is, is not to suggest that people can just use this evidence, it's to get people to think, to get them to problem solve. So the emphasis on ME, and it'd, uh, it'd be remiss of me not to mention uh, Professor Nick Tilley, who uh, is responsible for uh, that introduction, if he's in the audience, hasn't, uh, hasn't snuck out. Uh, the whole logic of that is to get people to get move beyond reflexively pulling stuff off the shelf, stuff that's been used. And it's not just transferring something from the UK to Mexico, it's transferring something from London to Manchester or, or whatever. Crime prevention is not about pulling ready-made solutions off the shelf, it's about thinking, it's about problem solving, it's about contextualising it for your own uh, situation. Now you can use previous evidence as a guide, you can, uh, you can try to understand the mechanisms that were working in that location and judge whether those same mechanisms will work in yours. But there are countless uh, examples of crime prevention uh, interventions that have worked in one location, they've been rolled out somewhere else uh, and, uh, and haven't worked. I won't go through them, others might bring out examples, but there are many of them. I think that's a, that's a great answer. Um, so I'll give a slightly different perspective on it. Um, I showed you the Liverpool John Moores University evidence base on violence prevention from which we got the map showing the distribution of where the evidence comes from. I also showed you the Inspire technical package. Now in the technical package we went out of our way not to look at systematic reviews and meta-analyses, but rather to find randomized controlled studies of interventions that were similar to those found to be effective in systematic reviews and meta-analyses but from low-income countries. And we were able to find a lot of them, and we were able to populate that document with examples that have been proven effective of parenting programs, environmental design programs, the implementation of laws around alcohol, uh, cognitive behavior therapy for victims of violence, etc. We were really surprised when we went out there to find evidence particularly from low and middle income settings that are so different to where, for instance, David Old's home visiting program was developed in the USA, but we found it. And then we also found another bunch of evidence that had to do specifically around income and economic strengthening of families, which typically doesn't happen in higher income or developed countries, which when coupled with parent training, for instance, showed big reductions in child maltreatment. So my tentative conclusion from that is that with careful adaptation to the new setting, probably quite a lot of those things which Richard showed will be effective. What we all want to know is what are the critical essential ingredients, and that's work which is still underway because those would be the things you want to preserve when you move an intervention from London to Lagos. Sí, tenía un pequeño comentario sobre eso. Quizás a la hora de, de la toma de decisión también hay que tener en cuenta cuál es el upside, el downside de, de la decisión. Quizás si es una evaluación hecha, una política hecha en otro lado, pero no tiene mucho riesgo, no tiene un gran downside, si te va mal, puede valer el riesgo de, de, de llevarla a cabo. Eh, en esto, hace poco discutiendo estos temas con un CEO de un hedge fund, doctor en matemáticas, le pregunté, bueno, qué modelos matemáticos usaba para decidir sus inversiones. Y, y me dijo que no, que no usaba modelos matemáticos, sino que usaba reglas heurísticas de cierto sentido de común. Obviamente, con cierto respaldo de ciencia, pero bueno, la idea era tratar de ver de qué, qué funcionaba en, en ciertos principios básicos. Creo que eso, esta, esta estrategia de mirar cuestión, principios básicos, por lo menos es un por más que no tengamos grandes evaluaciones, puede servir para resolver estos problemas. It's quite nice. I have another question that follows along a similar line. Um, I, I think... Um, well, the, the, question, the, the question is about publication bias. And the question 
So, so I mean, just to explain to everybody what the problem here is, some critics of the evidence-based movement, if you will, say that, well, these results are really not neutral because the chances that you get a publication, that the publication is accepted in a journal, um, that you actually make the effort to get to, to do a study and to publish the results are increased if you get positive results. Therefore, in pre violence prevention, we are all glad to have the scared straight ev evaluation because that's our prime example of the one program that we all can say it doesn't work and that justifies saying that, well, we have some genuine ev evidence. And, and if you look on our website, you'll find that review. Right. So, so I, I, I think that's a, a very valid concern and let me just add one other concern to this and I think, Diego, you raised this namely to what extent can we generalize from a randomized controlled trial to wider population effects, which is another important question. And so I, I just wonder whether you could say something about how you dealt with the problem or how you think about the problem of publication bias first and the extent to which these results from systematic reviews can be actually generalized to wider population. Well, I, I, th I think that publication bias is a serious problem and, um, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is um, you don't get published if you support the null hypothesis and if there are 100 papers that support the null hypothesis and, hypothesis and four that don't, th uh, then that actually isn't a significant result. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I mean, the only way you can really uh, try to cope with that, I guess, is to try to get... Uh, the so-called brown literature, try to get unpublished publications, but um, I think it's a serious issue as well. No, seguro, es un problema muy grande y de hecho en, en unos papers que mencioné eh, ellos se, eh, llegaban a eh, de, de otros autores, de Ronconi, Lindsay, Jadrowski, llegaban a no podían demostrar una un, eh, eh, refutar la hipótesis nula y entonces eh, se van a la conclusión que la, la política no servía y además con datos malos y yo se lo, eh, se lo reproché en un seminario y estaba el director de investigaciones de un organismo internacional y él cínicamente eh, contestó comentó que bueno si un, uno no, nunca va a publicar un paper diciendo que uno no llega a conclusiones entonces había que llegar a algún tipo Y lo mismo pasa cuando solo es significativo y no hay algo de fuerza. Y sí, hay, creo que en eso hay que tener cuidado y hay que tener más, mucha más honestidad por parte de la comunidad científica. Um, I won't speak more on the publication bias. I think it's been well answered. Um, on generalizing from a randomized controlled trial to a scaled up intervention, this is a, a big... Well, we, we haven't got... I don't think we have enough instances on record of where this has happened for us to say how frequently the scaling up may not work. However, there's a whole field of implementation research which is focused precisely on moving from a tightly defined experimental intervention which may get to a few thousand families, for instance, to trying to roll that out across a whole population of 30 million people, families within that. Of course, there are huge challenges to doing that because the ability to supervise the people doing the interventions, the intensity of the in intervention, the dose, and et cetera, is all likely to be compromised when you try to make things bigger. But this is not a challenge specific to crime or violence prevention. It's something that's experienced in public health in general, and I guess education and so forth. So there are many examples that we can look at in other areas of work to, work, to understand how to handle it. We have not much time left, but more questions keep, keep coming in. I think we have, well, we have time for two more questions. And, and one, I think, by El Elizabeth Worth, Ward is, is really worth discussing, uh, I think, especially in this context. And the, the simple question that she asks, and I think that's the background of the question that we talk a lot about collecting more data, 
We've all made a case here for, or you've all made a case here for better evaluation, better evidence. And she asked, well, where does the money come from? Now, they may have seen on your slide that you just got 3.7 million pounds. 3, 3.3. 3.3 to do a systematic review of meta-analysis. And people in Mexico will be asking, well, okay, everybody's saying we should do more systematic reviews, we should do more evaluations. How can we do this? And maybe it's not just a man money question. I just wonder whether you have any thoughts about how to get this going. Well, I mean, I don't have any answer to that. And uh, I mean, don't think that the 3.3 million grant uh, that we got is something that rolls into our office every every day either. It was we were popping the champagne corks when that when that arrived. I mean, I think uh, a further issue is okay. So there are some funding issues. Uh, certainly in terms of the kinds of funding that we uh, have access to. One of the frustrating things for us is that there's particularly little research, uh, research funding available to do um, cross-national um, uh, research. So we have colleagues, in fact, in, in areas of Latin America, we've thought about putting together uh, research projects and there are no places for us that will fund, uh, you know, so, so much of the funding that does exist tends to be parochial. So, gosh, I, I don't have any uh, solution to that except I'm as depressed about it as whoever wrote the question. Um, I'm unhappy with the situation, not yet depressed. Um, I Elizabeth makes a very good point. The Empower chart I showed on tobacco control was that that work kicked off with a half billion dollar grant from the Gates Foundation and Bloomberg. And that was for piloting the work in 30 countries. We are not anywhere on that kind of map. Um, work on road traffic injury prevention and smoke uh, is less well funded, but even there, there are hundreds of millions of dollars provided to international partners to work with relatively small numbers of countries to do things like speed control, drink driving, etc., etc. My experience with some of the donors is they're still not convinced enough that we can have an acute effect within a year or two in reducing mortality, in reducing, for instance, hospital emergency departments. They still remain to be convinced that we can get a big enough bang for uh, the big buck, at least on the violence prevention side. But things, I think, are improving. I, I want to ask a last question. So, so those of you who have given me questions and I didn't ask them, my apologies. It was, it's, it's just due to a limit of time. But I thought this last question is really important. It was asked to r you, Richard, but I think probably Alex and you, Diego, would also could also answer to this. And it, it's about the question about how you disseminate your findings, your conclusions about what works to policymakers. And I think in, in all policymaking contexts, this is a really important question. What strategies can help us to communicate these findings to policymakers? And, and so maybe each of you has some quick fixes, the three best strategies. Uh, no, uh, sorry, uh, just some ahead. ideas. That, that, I mean, that, that's, that is a great question, linking, uh, linking the research to, uh, to the real world and to the people who have to implement it. Um, and I think my department has a good record in that, but it, nevertheless, um, it, it's not an easy task. So the, uh, the what works uh, thing I showed you, uh, I mean, we disseminate that because it's simply a publicly available uh, website. I mean, you can all go away and click on that uh, when you leave and uh, look at those reviews and explore Emmy, and I hope some, some of you do. Um, it's, it's not just about exposing policymakers and practitioners to it, though. It's um, getting them to, uh, to take those things on board. Um, and I think it'll be interesting for us to check how widely uh, that website is to start tracking the, the use of those um, uh, guides or the, that evidence that's presented on the website and who's, who's looking at it. Um, one of our supposed clientele are the 
UK police because this is partly funded through the College of Policing and um, I'm, I'm not sure if we know yet just how widely the police are actually going to start using this evidence or whether they're you know, going to continue in, in their, their old ways. So, um, I, I mean, in our department we, we try to form partnerships, I guess is the way we do it. Um, we try to make sure that we're not an ivory, ta ivory tower research unit and we try to make links with, with government and um, uh, so much of this develops through personal contacts in that way. Again, I don't have any neat solutions and, um, and as I said, I think there's also a difference between presenting this evidence and putting it in front of people. Um, some of this stuff is deeply, either deeply counterintuitive or else it's actually not very politically, uh, a good political sale. So, I mean, we can bang on the doors of politicians and policy makers and have some effect, but there are some tried and true um, uh, slogans that politicians will always return to that are very hard to shake, like, you know, let's just get tough. No, sin duda es un tema que es muy importante y sobre todo porque estamos lidiando con organizaciones que son de las más resistentes al cambio. De todas formas, la comunicación siempre o la diseminación es como una especie de pacto con el diablo porque tiene sus riesgos y, si, y los científicos podemos tender a sobrevender eh, nuestros hallazgos y a su, para que tengan impacto y ni hablar si pasan a través de los medios de comunicación. Si no, podemos terminar como en el video ese que vimos de, de John Oliver. Pero sí, sin duda, bueno, la diseminación es clave. El tema es cómo lograrlo. Eh, y bueno, lo, y desde mi experiencia, como cuando está en la sociedad civil, bueno, la forma que los políticos te dieran eh, bola, como decimos en Argentina, era que meterlo en un medio de comunicación masivo. Um, very briefly, at the, in the World Health Organization, we are a member state organization, so we can speak directly to ministries of health. And that is what we do through the World Health Assembly and policy instruments like our Global Plan of Action on Addressing Violence. That's a very specific situation, but for the rest, I agree with what, what's been said. Thanks. Bueno, muchas gracias a todos. Quisiera decir que mañana continuamos con, um, uh, con este tema, uh, con um, una sesión su, utilizando mediciones, mediciones locales para orientar y monitorear los esfuerzos locales para prevenir la violencia y uh, continuamos su, su este tema. Muchas gracias. Thank you.